All right, guys, in this video, we're going to go over why I switched to Sony. Again, another Switch video. I know a lot of people, I got a lot of haters on here that are just like, bro, you go through so many cameras, blah, blah, blah. I've been with Canon for almost three years now. A lot has changed in the past year. In the past three years, I went from shooting mainly stills into mainly shooting video. And now I'm finally setting out to start shooting some of my passion projects, which is documenting indigenous people, reservations. I'm part Native American myself. And so one of my like missions in life has been to reconnect with all of that, but by doing documentaries. Not only that, but I also wanna make uh, documentaries on indigenous artists, activists, reservations, lands, like whatever it is, um, I, I, I just want to document it. So that's what set out this whole transition into Sony because they just have more to offer. There's no gatekeeping. Canon's just, uh, we'll get into it. So let's, let's just, let's go. <laughs> First off real quick, I already did a live saying while I was leaving Canon, but I'll touch on that a little bit more. Yes, I had the R5C. It was a great camera, great hybrid camera, but there's two different types of, of, of hybrid, two different types. Say one day you're doing a photo shoot, the next day you're doing a video shoot. R5C is perfection for that. But if you have a gig where you're shooting photos and videos on the same day, R5C is pure garbage just because of the battery life. You have to rig it up every time if you want to do video. The R5 is a little bit better, but the R5 overheats a little bit. The overheating got better on it, but the dynamic range is very limited on the R5. So hence the R5Cs, you get another two to three stops of dynamic range. Overall, the quality just looks better. Layout, the user interface, switching between photos and, and video. It's like the cinema menus are insane. But there's been a couple of gigs where the R5C was just not enough for how fast run and gun, uncontrolled situations. I'm still making good money on jobs like that. But you know what? I don't I, I don't always have the opportunity to set up a damn light, control where we're shooting at and all that. So you got to go with the flow. Basically, I was just saying Canon doesn't care about us. We saw what they did with third party lenses. They're suing them if they have any on focus or any like electric contact with the camera. Like if they really care about the customers and, and on all of us creatives and creators, they would give us third party lens support, but they're not. So I think that kind of uh, was the nail in the coffin to all of my suspicions on Canon. We go over real quick just with C-Log2. In order to get C-Log2 on the R5C, you have to shoot in RAW. RAW is not the most realistic codecs for a majority of my gigs. So I'm shooting music videos, R5C is perfect in the RAW. Otherwise, I'm going to a fashion client and I'm doing uh, motion for them. And I say, hey, I need like six terabytes of SSDs. Uh, because I'm shooting a raw and this is a week long shoot. They're going to be like, you're not getting that. So the XS AVC on the Canon R5C looks just fine, but then you're stuck with C-Log3. It's totally cutting off uh, probably like two to four stops of dynamic range that I get with raw. I know a lot of people say the sensor's not capable of that. I say bullshit. When I go and grade the raw, I can stretch the hell out of that footage. Uh, you just have to run noise reduction and all of a sudden you have all this other color info in the highlights and the shadows mostly in the shadows, but whatever. Obviously I'm doing way more video now. I like, I don't get hired as much for stills. It's all motion. And so some people say, oh, what about the C70? I own the C70, felt like I was gonna break it. I didn't really care for the layout. You still had it, like, like you needed two hands to get to certain buttons and everything. And it's super 35. I know a lot of people say they shoot movies on Super 35. Oh, they blah, blah, blah. I don't give a shit. With full frame sensors, it's the most, you, you get the most versatility out of it. So with my FX6, I can shoot at a, a base of 800 ISO or 12,800. How many times and situations have you been in when the creative director keeps pushing you, pushing, 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 all of a sudden you lose light and you're like, well, we can't shoot anymore because I, I just, there's no light. 12,800. Say if you're going to indoors and all of a sudden you're only light, say you're just getting started and you only could afford one light and that one light craps out on you, or all of a sudden like uh, you don't have power in whatever building you're in, 12,800 ISO is gonna be clutch. The C70 can't do that, has the dual gain output, it looks beautiful, it almost grades like raw footage, but, and then with Super 35, say, if I'm trying to get an ultra wide lens, I have to make sure for all my full frame cameras that I have an ultra wide for that, and then another ultra wide for Super 35. It's like having two different camera systems. With full frame, I could just crop into Super 35 on the sensor, and there you go. Now you could use Super 35 lenses. So uh, it's just full frame is way more versatile. You can hand a damn iPhone to a full on production team and they're going to make it look magical. That's not the point. The point is for all the solar operators, we need as much bang for a buck that we can get and full frame provides that. So that's my beef with Canon. They're not giving us all the performance that they can. We know that they could give us C-Log2. The whole excuse of all oh, the sensors can handle it. Bullshit. Again, if you shoot in raw, and use noise reduction, all of a sudden you have all this other dynamic range. Why can't they give us that in XF AVC or H265? They could. Here comes Sony. Any Sony camera you get, no matter if it's 500 bucks to 
$10,000, whatever, you're going to have S-Log3. S-Log3 gives you the most dynamic range out of whatever sensor it is. Even say if that sensor can't fully utilize the S-Log3, that's still, it's our choice to be able to use that or not. And they give us that choice. On top of that, I'm shooting on the Tamron 35 to 150 F2 to F2.8. Canon has no lenses like that. In order to get any proper decent camera lens, you're going to have to spend like 1600 bucks and more. Where on Sony, I could go get a Tamron 2875 and it's almost just as good as a Sony lens and it's a fraction of the cost. Sony's not holding anything back from us. They're, I feel like they're really out there looking out for us. They're, they're whatever camera it is. It's like, Hey, this sensor has 12 megapixels, but it's going to be amazing for video. This sensor has 32 megapixels and it's good for both video and photos. And now the A7R5 super high resolution camera, yet they're still throwing all these video features at us and they're constantly trying to give us as much as they can. So I know a lot of people are going to say, well, what about the R5 II that's coming out? That's great, but that's one camera and it's still not going to have C-Log2 and XF AVC. They're not going to give it to us. Canon's like a pyramid scheme. They don't, they don't care about what we can afford and, and us being starving artists and creators and business people trying to make money off our passion and, and creativity. They don't care about that. They care about the person walking to Best Buy and looking at all the Canon cameras for the name recognition and saying, I want that camera. I, I feel like that's their target audience. And I feel like they're going to lose a lot of us, like the actual people where they're actually dumping thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into their gear because they don't care about us. Sony's like very, I want to say they're very, it's almost like they're wholesome in a way to where they're willing to work with creatives. Uh, again, all the cameras is jam packed stuff. So let's lead into, uh, Sony ambassadors. Like many of you, when I first saw all these people switching to Sony, I was like, Sony's out here sniping people, just gobbling them up and making them all turn them into sellouts, blah, blah, blah. But the reason I thought that's because I wasn't familiar at all with the Sony lineup at all. Um, I was just kind of, uh, ignoring all of it. I was having my Canon gear until, uh, uh, my it's there's things developing that I'll go into in a little bit here in a second. But as soon as I started to find all the faults in the whole Canon lineup, I started to finally like listen up to what Sony was offering and all these creators talking about it. And uh, I soon realized I was like, oh, OK, so I've been kind of uh, uh, throwing some shade at Sony when they have like all these amazing cameras that there's no compromises in them. If there's a compromise in a camera from Sony, it's because it's like, it's just not capable of doing it. Though, Sony, please give us anamorphic D-stretch and possibly uh, open gate readout. Uh, maybe you have to go down to H.264 and 8-bit, I don't know, but just give us that. That's all, that's the only thing I, I need that's missing from Sony. So anyways, when I started to get into the whole Sony lineup, looking at it, I hit up Armando, because we all know Armando's just like love Sony. So I started asking about it and he was so excited, <laughs> so thrilled. But Armando then connected me with all his Sony people. So I don't know if I'm a Sony ambassador or what, I don't know, but they loaned me these two lenses. They loaned me the FX30. I still pay for the FX6 and the A7R5, like still money out of my pocket. So no, my job is not to be a salesman to you guys. Uh, my job is not to tell you to go buy this camera. My job is to educate you guys through what I'm learning myself. That's I'm passionate about all this. I could be out in a beautiful location making tons of money on a gig. In the back of my mind, I was like, I wish I was making a YouTube video right now. I, I don't know why I'm like that, but I just love doing YouTube. And so I will never be that person of like, hey, this brand sponsoring me, go buy their shit. No, that's not what that's not what I'm about. I like to keep it just upfront and honest. I'm honest to a fault. Uh, sometimes it gets me in trouble in life. Sometimes it doesn't, I mean, whatever. But anyways, we'll see how this relationship with Sony develops and everything. Let me touch a little bit upon my my needs real quick. In October, I got to direct this job where it kind of relit a previous passion of mine and a previous goal that I just kind of always ignored just because I was kind of too overwhelmed to really go after it. Um, and that's making indigenous documentaries, covering different reservations and native artists. And uh, this gig that I did, it kind of just opened a floodgate to me wanting to do that. And when that happened, I had my R5C rigged out for another documentary thing I'm not allowed to talk much about right now, but I, just, it's, I don't know, I just realized it wasn't the camera uh, for that job. And so that's where my career is leading to. So again, when I started like all the Sony stuff, the FX6 just like, I was like, okay, I get this camera now. When it first came out, I totally ignored it. I did not care about it at all. Before I start talking about that, let's talk about color science real quick. This is gonna be a long ranting video, I apologize, but color science. So you guys know in previous videos, I said I didn't care for uh, Sony color science. Their color science has developed a lot. Part of the reason I was saying that back then was because I was trying to figure out the look 
that I was trying to like, I had a look in mind. I didn't know how to do that look. I was self-aware that most of it was like on me, but I was blaming other cameras of like, oh, I just can't get the camera to look the way I want it, blah, blah, blah. It is our job to know how to get any camera to look any way we want. Especially when you're shooting in raw or in log, we'll talk about video after this. When you're shooting in raw, we have all this color info and dynamic range within a photo. Why can't we get it to look the way we want it if it's all just color science? It's all just color. I was questioning this myself and when I had the Canon, I figured out the Canon didn't need any color adjustments. It just needed a curve. And that was the way I started to like get a film look out of my uh, all my Canon stuff. Uh, on top of that, with then going grade, I didn't have to do any huge shit. I was like, let me go and test all of this like newfound uh, information uh, on my old A7R4 files. Did that and I was like, Oh, like this looks pretty damn good actually. So in the past month when I started researching all the Sony stuff, I had a bunch of buddies send me stuff. Armando sent me some footage. Gabe and Alex sent me some footage. Like I was able to edit five images that look just like my Canon stuff, which I wouldn't, I like, I'm sure you be saying it looks like my Canon stuff. It just looks like my stuff. I was able to edit those five images within like 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, no Photoshop or anything, all just capture one and it looked just like all my other stuff. Just to drive that fact a little bit more, I get bombarded with DMs and comments on my Instagram of people saying, was this shot with your Fuji or your Canon? Was this on film? Just goes to show you like it's all, it's up to us to have that look and to know how to get that look. I can say that Canon helped me get to that point. But now that I have all that knowledge on how to get the look I like, editing the files off this is a breeze. Let's talk about video real quick. When it comes to log, there's no, there's even less excuses. If you're having trouble grading your Sony footage, stop blaming the footage. It's your fault. This is why it's your fault. First, get rid of Final Cut or get rid of Premiere. And if you're serious about color grading, get DaVinci Resolve. And if you say, oh, but that doesn't work for my workflow, then then get over it. Like don't focus on your colors then. Because if you want to get the colors you want and you can't do it in Final Cut Premiere, you need to get on DaVinci and here's why. Here's the secret to life. Shoot log footage on any camera, put it into DaVinci, put the color space transformer. You could put the log profile in there, change it to Ari log, put an Ari LUT on it, all of a sudden you got Ari colors. No, it does not look exactly like Ari because the Ari sensors are like the best in the world. We all know that, but it will look pretty damn close and you won't have any excuses from there. DaVinci's color space transformer is all mathematical equations and blah, blah, blah. And it's a magical thing. It's what I use for all, pretty much all of like the, the LUTs that I made. And I, I have already made LUTs for uh, both of these Sony cameras. So I'm, I'm in the testing phase. So once I get those nailed down, I'll put those up for everyone to get. But so that, that's your answer to life. Again, when it comes to log, color science does not matter. If you want to argue workflows, too damn bad. Workflows are made to develop as your work develops. Uh, if you're stuck in old ways, that's not our fault. That's your fault. So for all of you guys who have been following for a while, you've seen my previous uh, setups from my Red Komodo, to my R5C, to like super old videos of my Fuji setup. When you start rigging out the Komodo, the Komodo's body weighs more than just the, this FX6 body alone. I think it's like twice as heavy. You then have to start rigging all these other parts to it. It's gonna be heavy no matter what. It's a freaking tank of a camera. It's still one of my favorite cameras. It's just, uh, it's not as versatile as this guy is. Fast forward to the R5C. R5C had horrible battery life. And so you had to rig that up. My whole, go look at my other videos of it. My whole setup on that was a bunch of metal pieces on there. Then you go and slap on lenses and a top handle and a monitor. It's the same damn size, possibly even a little bit heavier than this because all the extra metal I had to put on that to get it rigged out. This guy, the body alone's uh, right under two pounds. Depending on what your lens, you know, lens could, if you put a cinema glass on this, cinema glass is gonna be even heavier than the camera. The top handle, super light. The only heavy thing on this is this damn monitor and this battery on here. Even the internal battery on here, I have a core uh, battery. It's a 98 watt battery. We'll see when I get in the field, how long this lasts me. I'm assuming it's gonna last me over half a day, maybe even a full day. I'm the type of person that turns my camera on and off. But real quick, we can compare it to the R5C and the C70. One, R5C is still a mirrorless hybrid camera. It is not a proper cinema build out. As you guys saw, I had to rig it out. It would have been nice if I didn't have to rig it out for every gig. I could go and mess with my R5, but knowing that the R5C has way better quality, way better dynamic range, I didn't want to touch the R5 for actual gigs after that when it came to video. You no, know, but that's the name of the game. You know, that's what we have to do. This thing, all it is, this little monitor and this handle and the body. That's all you really need to run this kit. 
because it has internal NDs. I don't have to mess with VNDs anymore unless I'm shooting, you know, with this camera. Here's the big difference between the C70s NDs and this ND. The C70s is two, four, six, eight, and I think it goes up to 10 stops of ND. There's times where I'm shooting anamorphic and between those two stops, there's like a, a perfect aperture I would want to use. It happened a lot. But since I can't fine tune the NDs on the C7, I had to close down my aperture a lot of time and lose a lot of that waterfall bokeh that I like. With the E ND on this, the electronic ND, you could do like 0.3 adjustments on this. You could fine tune the, the uh, ND on this. On top of that, the auto ND. When everyone was talking about this, I was like, I would never use that. It's a gimmick. It's uncontrollable, blah, blah, blah. Now using it, it is like the most natural looking. It's legit just you taking a VND and just spinning it as you're about to go out, except you don't have to do it. It does it automatically. On top of that, VNDs, they're, it's two polarizers stacked on each other. So you're going to get polarization. You're gonna get, no matter what company says, oh, we have no color shift. There's color shift because it's polarizers. It's going to shift your blues. It's, it might shift your skin tones. It's going to put strong gradations into your, if you have big blue skies, like VNDs are just, it's, they're insanely clutch and versatile, but there's a lot of downsides that come to it. That's why I love running matte boxes because the image you get out of it, even the lens flares you get from a matte box, there's just, it's clean and it looks like, I don't want to say cinematic, but it looks professional. Groundbreaking. Again, I'll do a more in-depth video. There's things where if I want to shift my ISL, this little button have preset set into it. It goes down two stops, four stops, whatever I set it to. Cine EI mode, which is almost like shooting a uh, red raw. It's totally different. I know all the, the red fanboys are gonna be, ooh, it's not the same. It's basically, if I'm shooting 800 ISO, if I change the ISO, the log stays at 800, so I'm getting all the damage range. And basically the preview on my monitor can be darkened or brightened or whatever. We'll go into that another time. My only gripe with this camera is that there's no one, I mean, anamorphic support, but two, you have to have this top handle on if you're gonna be running audio to this. I don't know why they did that. There's not even a 3.5 millimeter jack on here, which drives me pretty nuts. So if you could just like make us a little audio adapter that could just go on top of there, that maybe like it goes to the side. So we still rock a top handle or something like that, but a smaller one. I love smaller top handles, like this thing's intrusive, but that one little tiny gripe, it's it's nothing compared to how versatile this camera is. So again, I'll do a full review about it another time, but uh, now let's talk about the A7R5. I'm going to switch out these cameras real quick. So the audio is probably gonna sound a little bit better because I could actually use like a phantom power shotgun mic. The mic I was using the A7R5 is just this little DD mic so see this how i will be rocking it with a half cage with this setup i'll pretty much be able to do actual hybrid gigs on this and not have to worry i could go and do a mall development shoot and uh be able to do photos and videos at the same time uh an actual hybrid system so this does have the same sensor as the a7r4 like i told you i went back and edited old files and uh they looked just as good as my Canon stuff now, because again, I learned how to get the look that I wanted. It wasn't, had nothing to do with the color science. It has to do with your ability and your knowledge and your skill set on getting your look that you want. The, the big secret to getting the film look is within your curves and creating filmic S curves. Uh, but that's a whole nother thing. That's what all my presets are based off now. So anyways, no matter what camera you have, you get a film look out of it. If you go out and shoot film, Shoot, go, go and shoot film for a year. Your eye will start developing on that. And you'll realize, depending what lab you send it to, what film you set it on, who develops it, the film's going to look different. No matter what, it's going to look different. There's no consistency. The only consistency is to shoot the same film stock, get it developed at the same place, and get it scanned the same way at the same place. Uh, and that's the only way to get a consistent film look out of whatever you're trying to do. I'm not scared of the sensor. Uh, they've updated to where it's pretty much can hold up to video performance now. The Avson R4, uh, the video is okay with it. Uh, this thing is just a, it's a powerhouse. I know everyone's raving about the monitor. Say if I'm on a photo gig and I'm trying to get as low as possible, I'm having to do this. And a lot of times my, my X axis goes off and my horizons are all like shifted. I don't realize it because I'm looking at this instead of where the sensor plane's at. It's great for this type of stuff. So again, the major cool thing about the screen is you can flip it up. You can flip it down, it comes all the way off of there. So it just makes life a lot easier, honestly. That just goes to show that Sony's looking out. They're like, yes, we know this is a high resolution sensor, but also it is a great hybrid video camera. They, they basically please both of us. They please the photographer and the videographer. On top of that, full HDMI. Sony has been doing full HDMI for a minute now. 
Cannon's barely about to do it on the R5 too. Like again, Cannon's just, I'm tired of waiting for them to update cameras. I'm tired of waiting for them to give a C-Log 2. Like I want as much dynamic range as I can get even for these damn YouTube videos because I'm spending thousands of dollars on this gear. Give me what I want. I'm tired of waiting for lenses. I'm tired of having a limited lens choice, not having the most dynamic range that the sensor can give us. Yeah, it's just a great camera. Again, I will do a full on review about this camera. I just need to actually use it first. I need to do some fashion shoots with it. I need to do some uh, video shoots with it and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll update you guys on that soon. Sony, my request for this camera, Cine EI, please give us Cine EI in this camera. Uh, also anamorphic support, please give us anamorphic support. Uh, and one other thing too, I found out you can assign a button, you could tracking on toggle. Uh, you can set the custom button to that. When you click that, whatever you put your, your focusing point on, it will track it. Click again, it'll take it off the tracking. I wish the FX6 had that because say I didn't want to use the external monitor on it. The only re reason I'm really using that monitor still is uh, for the touch to track. In the FX6, if they gave us an option to set a custom button to that tracking on toggle, that would like, ah, uh, that would, if, oof. Please, please, Sony, I know you love us. Give us, give us these, just these few little tiny more, few, just a tiny bit more. Tiny bit more. Oh, my notes real quick. Cause I did do a questionnaire thing on Instagram and someone asked, why did you pick the A7R5 versus the Canon R5? I'm kind of in the same boat right now. This is one thing when I was about to switch to Sony, I thought I was going to get a lot of hate, but it's been the opposite. There's a lot of people contemplating switching because we keep hearing all these amazing things that Sony's doing. We're over here just like, well, maybe Canon in like two years will give us that. Maybe when they finally release the R1, it will give us that. Uh, but then you're still stuck with RF lenses and who knows if you're going to get C-Log2 and on and on and on. And the way I reply with that is S-Log3 versus C-Log3. C-Log3 is pure garbage. I, I don't care if you want to argue the whole workflow thing again. Uh, I hate C-Log3. C-Log2 is the GOAT when it comes to Canon and they're not giving us their GOAT profile. Why? Why? I, I've spent maybe like $30,000 on Canon gear. Why can't I fucking have C-Log2 in any of the cameras? Unless I shoot raw. It's ridiculous. More bang for your buck. More features, better video, more hybrid features. Like this camera is just, again, for the price, it's it's priced similar around the R5. You're getting way more camera out of this, way more dynamic range. Uh, I would say autofocus performance. I mean, there's a new, uh, you could you could uh, set the faces and all that. I don't know, but autofocus performance is, I, I didn't have an issue with it in the Canon and, and this is, I haven't had any issues with it in this either. Here's a little comment that came from YouTube. Someone said, Sony has zombie skin colors. Otherwise I would get it too. I had to spend all my time editing colors with Sony. So I biffed it. Sure, maybe the look that he wants, it's easier for him to get that look out of Canon without knowing as much, you know? Uh, and then Niambi replied, it's a little, I think it's a little bit of broken English, so uh, bear with it. Color is a language of you as a DP. Nothing that I see except weddings have a brand color. In fact, cameras are praised for being able to get the color you want. I never understood that co Canon color argument. What are you trying to communicate with your colors? There you go. As DPs, as photographers, it is our job to know how to pick up any camera and get the look that we need to get out of it. All these cameras are throwing so much quality at us. All the Canon cameras, all the Sony cameras, Panasonic, Fuji. Uh, they're all giving us so much quality out of it that we have no excuse to not to be getting the look that we want out of them. Again, I used to say the same shit and it was because I didn't know how to get the look out, out of it. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I knew, I had an idea what the look I want to get, but I didn't know how to get it. And now that I know how to get it, I can get it with any camera, any camera, guarantee it, any camera. And I bet a lot of you guys have been shooting for a while or just like naturally inclined on how to get the look you want. Um, you're just like, you, your whole vision just sets out apart from everyone else. 1000%, you give them an iPhone, give them film, give them any camera brand, they're gonna get that look out of it. That's what it comes down to.